There are times as sewers when we put the wrong fabric and pattern together. We learn each time that happens and there is always room for another try. When a company called ILC Dover puts fabric and pattern together, they are putting that result into outer space and there is zero tolerance for error because they are protecting the life of an astronaut. How are spacesuits made? What fabrics are used? How are they fitted? How much do they weigh? So many questions and we have the answers today on Fit to Stitch. Fit to Stitch is made possible by Kai Scissors. Benno's Buttons. OC Sewing, Orange County. Vogue Fabrics. Pendleton Imitation of Life and Clutch Nails There is a company named ILC Dover and I'll bet most of us have never heard that name and yet most of us know exactly who they are. I'm gonna bring on Dan Klopp from ILC Dover because he's going to help us understand who this company really is. <laughs> I am so excited to have you. I'm just thrilled that he's here and how much we're gonna learn about this is incredible. <laughs> who is That's ILC point. Dover? So ILC Dover is a company that was originally formed back in the 1930s in upstate New York okay. as International Latex Corporation. Okay. So that's where the ILC. ILC, International, International Latex Corporation. And in the early days of International Latex Corporation, um, they developed a government contracting business and a um, consumer products business. Um, we are a legacy of the government contracting business. Okay. Um, as the story goes, uh, they um, came up with the idea for inflatable life rafts. Oh. So prior to that, um, like life, big inflatable life rafts. Well, prior right. to that, life rafts, so you, we've all seen the movie Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> um, the life rafts were hard shelled. They were like a hard, they were a boat that was stored on the ship. Right. Um, what ILC came up with is a, is a way to dip canvas into latex rubber and form a watertight How fascinating. barrier. And that made an inflatable life raft so you could pack it down so you could carry a lot more life rafts in a lot smaller volume. Because there wasn't enough life rafts on the Titanic. Exactly. <gasps> wow. Exactly my point. Okay. Anyway, during World War II, that part of the business, for obvious reasons, um, was, uh, was very successful. Mm -hmm. um, and then after World War II, the company decided to split into two companies. They decided to split away from the, uh, the, the consumer products bit, uh, which that bit became known, the company name was the most famous trade name that they had under that, which is Playtex Corporation. Wow. Um, and then we are a legacy of, because we were located by that time in Dover, Delaware, and so they decided to name our part of the company ILC Dover. So the ILC to International Latex, and then Dover because we're in Dover, Delaware. Um, and the, so there was a running joke during the Apollo spacesuit era that the same engineers that designed spacesuits <laughs> design ladies' undergarments. Latex girdle. <laughs> and, 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 which, is, which is not quite true, although both companies have the same historical root. Right, right, um, right. But it made for a good press. And, All right, good joke. A good story. Good joke. Yes. It's, so the spacesuit's kind of like wearing a little girdle. It's kind yes. of like. Well. It's, so there what, are similarities. What started this for me, and the fascinating is we talk about all these fabrics, is a spacesuit is made with a sewing machine. That's correct. Much of that spacesuit, maybe not all of it, but much right. is made with a spacesuit. And you make these suits, and you have sewing machines at your plant. Yes, we do. That's fascinating to me. Yes. Women are sitting behind sewing machines making the spacesuits. And some men. And some men, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> making spacesuits. Making spacesuits. On, uh, yeah, what look like ordinary Singer sewing machines that you wow. would have. That's just somehow, I, I guess I just, I didn't know. So I want to answer all those questions. 
So can we first talk maybe about the fabrics that are just simply involved? Yes. Is it just, yeah, so, just. So there are lots of layers to a spacesuit. So first of all, before we get into that, okay. um, could I just do a real short oh, kind of educational please, bit on absolutely, spacesuits? Please. There's two major categories of spacesuits in today's okay. world. Okay. There are um, what are called launch entry um, suits. Uh, some people call them AES. Some people call them IVA. There's a whole bunch of acronyms that they go by. Yeah. Um, those are the spacesuits that are worn um, only for um, an hour or so during launch and then taken off once they're in orbit and then an hour or so during re-entry. Those are the two most dangerous parts of a space mission. Okay. We are starting to make those kind of spacesuits, but that's not our legacy. I see. Our legacy is what are called EVA spacesuits. So that's the other category where the spacesuit is, it's a very intentional activity. Um, the astronaut gets into the spacesuit and does a spacewalk. And so in the early days when, when we were doing this, we were doing the Apollo era suits. So those spacewalks were on the surface of the moon. I got it. In today's world, they're done from the International Space Station. So that, that spacewalk suit, yes. they're, the one that's the launching, the one that they have in the travel to and from yes. is more protective, more rigid, more... So it's actually less protective because it's never intended to be used outside the spacecraft. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so it's it. less protective. It's, okay. uh, that suit will not keep you alive during a spacewalk. It's only meant to be, it's sort of like the seatbelt in a car. Sure. It's, um, it's designed to keep the astronauts safe in case of a cabin, rapid cabin depressurization um, until the, um, with um, abort sort of systems that they have in the spacecraft, they can get back down to a safe altitude. Okay. Um, now do we get to talk about the fabrics? Now we get to talk, well, now, <laughs> so that's really separate and distinct from the EVA spacesuits, which are extravehicular okay. activity, I which... I that, EVA, the acronym, right. EVA, yeah. yes. okay. And so that's, that's, the space suit becomes a sp personal spacecraft for the astronaut for the duration of that EVA, which today's because they EVAs... Because actually, it has to be fully contained. Fully they contained. They have to leave the space suit. They leave the spacecraft, okay. and in today's world, it's the International Space Station, and go do some maintenance mission, perhaps, on the outside of the International Space Station, okay. and that'll last typically six to eight hours. So Not once only. they put it all on, so once they put they're it all gonna on, keep it on they keep until it on. the whole thing is done. Exactly, and they're completely separate from the life support system that's inside the International Space Station that keeps them alive in space while they're inside. Self-contained, it's, yeah. it's completely so self-contained. So the suit is completely self-contained. It even has an emergency propulsion system, propulsion system if one of their tethers comes loose. That's and fascinating. They can... You see that on movies, but I never knew if it was really true where they click the button and off they well, go. Well, it's actually a little gun-shaped thing ah. that squirts a jet of uh, high-pressure air out, and that's enough oh, that's... with a lack of gravity to allow them to maneuver, depending on which direction they're pointing it, oh, allow them to maneuver back to the spacecraft. That's interesting. Now, that never happens because they always have they're the clip. They're always tethered. They have clip-on. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you where those clips go on the, on the space. Well, that sounds so, I'm so excited to get over there, but we have to <laughs> go through the stuff. Go, let's go through the fabric. We have to go good yes. through the fabrics. So, um, so the space I, suit, I, yeah. I, I want to know, like, what are these fabrics? They, they can be sewn on a sewing machine. I don't really understand how they can be protective and sewn on the sewing machine at the same time. So, um, so over every seam, because when the needle penetrates the fabric, yeah, it gotta... causes a, a place where the spacesuit could leak. A problem. Um, so we have various techniques where we seam seal mm -hmm. the seams, and sometimes it's done by glue, sometimes it's done depending on which layer of fabric, and as we'll see in a minute here, there are many layers to a spacesuit. Um, we might uh, heat weld or ultrasonically weld that seam on, um, in addition to, the, you know, to um, make that stitch line airtight. So this, the sewing can be done first to kind of get it right. right, and then you come back and just finish it all with that seaming. Exactly. And you, you, there obviously has to be some way to test that the seaming is... Yes, and know, the suits are tested multiple times. Because I mentioned times. in the beginning that you don't get try two. Right, it's try exactly. Zero, exactly. We zero have a, tolerance. We have a saying in ILC Dover that failure is not an option. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> failure means somebody's life. Somebody's, somebody yeah. will perish. Wow. Um, all right, so, well, sorry. So, um, so the spacesuit consists of many layers, okay. um, and it all has to do with um, all the things that we take for granted here on Earth, but um, are really different in space once you get outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So um, the outer layer of the spacesuit is uh, woven from a fabric, uh, a, a fiber called Vectran, which is a close cousin of Kevlar. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, we call this the TMG layer. That's thermal micrometeoroid garment. Okay. Um, and 
Um, it provides some thermal protection by being white, so it reflects most of the um, most of the light away and keeps it helps keep the astronaut cool when they're on the sunny side of the Earth. But more importantly, it's more or less like a bulletproof vest. Because one of the things that's in space that we never see here on Earth, because they burn up in the atmosphere as they're entering, are micrometeorites. Sure. Small pieces of space dust that are flying sure. at just incredible velocities. Like how fast? Because like I know you know. Over 17,000 miles an hour. Yeah, so, so anything and becomes major. Anything becomes small. major, because for those of us that remember back to our high school physics, which very few of us do. Um, <laughs> We've but I happen, to work in the, I happen to work in this area, so I do remember this, is uh, kinetic energy is a function of uh, mass times velocity squared. Right, right. It's one half, one half mv squared. So it goes um, and so although the mass is very low on these, the velocity is much, much higher than, Except say, a man. bullet right. um, would be here on Earth. So this is a variation on a bulletproof vest. So it stops those micrometeoroids from penetrating. Underneath that are several layers of insulation, which are aluminumized mylar, mm -hmm. and there's many layers of that in the spacesuit. And obviously the number of layers are needed. And the, all those layers are needed um, because there are some pretty big temperature extremes okay. in space. Um, there's um, on, so take, let's take the International Space Station as an example. Um, that orbits every 90 minutes, um, which means what they experience in 90 minutes is what we experience here on Earth in 24 hours. Sure. So they have roughly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. On the daylight side of the Earth, um, the temperatures can be upwards of plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my goodness. Because you don't have the atmosphere sort of moderating those temperatures. Because as we all know, first thing in the morning when the sun's up, it's not instantly the hottest part of the day. Right. It takes right. a long right. time for it to right. heat up. And same thing when the sun sets in the evening, it's not the coldest part of the day oh, as soon gosh. as the sun sets. So it takes a while for that temperature to come it's down. things I don't think we think about. Right. That you guys have to think about. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in space, you don't have any atmosphere around you, so you don't have that moderating effect. So on the sunny side, it's about, nominally about plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. On the dark side, it's um, below minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my. And so, the space suit? So every 45 minutes, so you're oh. thinking about a 90 minute transit, you're transitioning from either plus to minus or minus to plus, sure. and it can be as much as a 500 degree temperature swing. So Jeez. much, much Jeez. more radical conditions than anywhere found on Earth. Sure. I mean, you can go to the Sahara Desert and it's not that hot, and you can go to Antarctica and it's not that cold. Right, right, so right. that's why we have many layers of insulation. Right. Um, so that's for the, the cold side of the Earth. Okay. So all this reflects the, the uh, astronauts' body heat back at them. Got it. Then there's a the liner. The goal is to keep the suit keep the, the same temperature. Keep the suit that will keep the astronaut the same temperature. Regardless of what's going on outside. Right, and yeah. so the outer layer of the suit goes through some pretty big temperature swings, right. but by the time you get down to the astronaut's skin, wow. you want that to be the same. So then there's a liner layer, which just sort of keeps everything sliding against each other sure. to keep it more mobile. Then there's what we call a restraint layer. So this is made from a fabric that is, um, is not stretchable. Um, it doesn't, uh, the fibers don't stretch. Um, and that's because what that does is it restrains the bladder layer. So this bladder layer is PVC coated nylon, so it's airtight, and it's essentially a balloon. So it has to maintain the pressure inside the suit. Okay. And if we didn't have the restraint layer, this bladder layer would just balloon out. Sure, sure. Um, so that, this is what uh, provides... Appropriately named. Restraint. Restraint. Uh, so it restrains it. the, the yep. bladder layer from ballooning out too much. Got it. And that, that makes up the suit itself. Got it. We also make two undergarments that go, that the astronauts have to put this on. This is my favorite layer. Um, yeah, this, this yeah, we this call the cool. LCVG. So you know NASA, they love their acronyms. <laughs> so LCVG stands for Liquid Cooling and Ventilation Garment. Okay. And what this is, is uh, think of it as a pair of long underwear that we weave a fine gauge tubing through, and this is like the radiator in your car. So there's water that's pumped through this. Mm -hmm. It's actually some variation of, uh, of uh, coolant like it's mm -hmm. in your car radiator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then goes through a heat exchanger in the backpack, uh, the life support backpack, and it removes excess body heat. Ah, it's just then. Amazing. So it's just like the radiator in your car removes excess heat from the engine to keep your engine from overheating. Sure. Sure. This, on the, that sunny side of the earth, um, where the temperatures are really high, above boiling point here on Earth, uh, that keeps the astronaut from boiling. It takes, yeah. takes excess heat out. And then underneath that is a very fine layer of, um, of a, uh, another undergarment. 
And underneath that, a thing that nobody likes to talk about, um, is an adult diaper. Got it. Because so if they're out, they're out in the doing typical their spacewalk, spacewalk is they don't get to, six to eight hours. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. If let's go look calls, at the EMU. <laughs> let's go look I at I want to go EMU. look at it. This is just way too much fun. <laughs> so EMU, I've learned my acronym. <laughs> yes. Is extravehicular mobility, mobility unit. unit. Because this functions as their little spacesuit. Right. So a spacesuit, an EVA spacesuit, is a spacecraft. I hate to ask this stuff, but has this thing ever failed an astronaut? Has no. something ever really never? Never. You have zero errors on this. Zero failures. That's impressive. And we've been doing this for 55 years, going all the way back to the Apollo era. So you're really like NASA, because NASA does not make spacesuits. That's correct. Okay. So I love we're ILC that. Dover, who was a contractor to NASA, and we're the ones all... that have been doing the spacesuits for NASA for 55 years. So all these fabric layers. Yes. How much do they weigh? Um, so the fabric plus um, things that aren't fabric, like the helmet bubble and uh, and the, the visors um, and sun shields and so forth, and including the life support backpack. Okay. Um, with all the life support systems inside of it, all configured and ready to go through the airlock on a spacewalk for the International Space Station is roughly 300 to 350 pounds here on Earth. Um, now, of course, when it's in orbit, it's you're in a zero G environment, sure. so it so weighs it nothing. Matter. So you don't have to really consider weight. The goal is protection. We have protection. to consider mass, but we don't have to consider weight, which okay. are two related, but Slightly different things. All right, so what about, um, so the weight is substantial. What about the cost? Um, so, so these are really expensive. However, um, when you consider how few we actually make, so in the history of human space travel, including like all governments, sure. Sure. Um, there have been less than 300 astronauts in like 60 years of human space travel oh, wow. that have ever taken an EVA. So if you just do a little simple math, on that, yeah, um, that's less than five astronauts a year, on so, average. So I want to talk a little bit about the the fit because it doesn't have to be specific to that astronaut. It can be, you know, it, you. It so let me talk about, about the different generations. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so Thank you. going all the way back to the Apollo era, the um, what we called the A7L suit, which was the Apollo era suit. Those were custom fit to each astronaut. So the astronauts in the Apollo era would come to our factory in central Delaware and get individually measured and fitted. And those little seamstresses would just go at it. Would go at them. it okay. for a specific, so that suit was for that astronaut okay. and that astronaut only. Okay. Um, then we got into the space shuttle era okay. and that's the, the starting point of what we call the EMU today, okay. the sector of it, which is this suit here. This is the um, Terry. This Terry's is, the EMU. <laughs> I know you want to name it. We named um, it Terry. Not male, named, not female, just Terry. Just Terry. Um, anyway, this generation suit, um, we tried to make, because NASA was being more inclusive in that era, mm -hmm. um, Sally Ride, first That's right. American female in space. So females were starting to go to space, which tend to have different body dimensions than males. And so we needed that to becomes design, design in more um, resizability than we had in the Apollo era suits because sure. it was impractical um, and cost prohibitive for NASA, they just didn't have the budget, um, to do a custom suit for each astronaut. Sure, sure. And so sure. in this era, that um, it's a modular suit. So the, there's an upper torso, we make that in three different sizes. Um, there like are a up, small, medium, large, small, basically. Small, medium, large, basically. Okay. Um, and so for any new astronaut coming into the program, they'll try on and figure out which, which is best for them. Of those three and really sizes. because this part of the spacesuit, it's not critical that they have movement. Right. So it doesn't have to. Well, in fact, fit. this generation suit, this is hard. Oh, this is what's hard. called a hard upper torso okay. suit, which is different than the Apollo suits, which are a soft upper torso. So this is a hard upper torso, three sizes. Okay. Um, and then there are, we have multiple sizes of upper arm, multiple sizes of lower arm, many, many sizes of gloves, because gloves are the most critical part. Because they're working with their hands. Because they work with their hands. Um, and then the lower torso, we don't have that many sizes, but it's not that critical. Because what we call a spacewalk is kind of a misnomer. You're not walking on anything. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a space float Can't go. <laughs> is, is a better way of thinking of it. Space float, because they're floating. So the bottom floating. half of their body is the really just... Their, yeah, and in fact, the, this does not have boots in it. It's what I, I call space booties. Got it. It's like a onesie. Um, there's, because they're not walking on anything. Their so legs are just dangling. So all the dangling. mobility comes from wrist to shoulder, shoulder to elbow, 
and hands, obviously. Right, and hands. And the hands are the most critical. So right now we're up to 64 different sizes of hands of gloves that we make. Who would think? And actually, as of a few weeks ago, we were only at 63. Um, a new astronaut was coming through the program several weeks ago, and she just happens to, a female astronaut, uh, Jasmine, she happens to have unusually long, skinny <laughs> fingers, okay. and she tried on the 63 different sizes that we already have, and, and they have didn't fit, 64? so we made a custom size for her. Just for the dexterity of just the fingers. Just for the dexterity. So that's that critical. That that's, movement right. is that critical. And the, and the part that makes, so that our spacesuit engineers will say that if you can design a glove, you can design an entire spacesuit. So it's fascinating to me because I would never think of spacesuits as evolving, but they are. Yes. So Terry has a, a new version? Oh, there's, well, actually there's been EMU. multiple variations of the EMU. Okay. Since the EMU, since the beginning of the shuttle program, because various fabrics uh, will find new alternatives, sure, um, and then we'll qualify them. But there is a new version. But now, people, more people are going to the moon besides NASA. Well, more people have... are going to space. Yeah. So we'll see who goes to the moon. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> I got it. Right now, they're just going to space. Right. So this is. So this is what we call our Astro spacesuit. This is um, a prototype of the next generation of spacesuit. Okay. Um, so this has even more resizability than the EMU suit. Um, this one has, uh, we've designed this um, with what we call a hybrid upper torso. So it has okay. sort of the best of the Apollo era suits with the soft upper torso and the EMU generation suits with a hard upper torso. This is a hybrid. It's a kind of a combination. And yet these shoulders still screw in. Are they, they, well, the, 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 arm, the upper arm and lower arm pieces yeah. are virtually identical to the EMU. What's okay. different is where they attach. We have oh, that makes a lot um, of sense. resizability elements in the shoulder bearings, so we can do fine adjustment on that. Interesting. And uh, we've designed this so that it'll cover 99% of humanity, so roughly from a five foot tall woman up to a six foot four person. So the EMU was limited in size from what to what, roughly? Uh, the, the smallest version of that, um, I think the smallest astronaut that ever took a spacewalk in that was around five foot six. Okay. Um, but this can go all the way down to five foot. Wow. A five foot tall person. So if you're little and rich, yeah. you got and, the outfit And it can go, go all the way up to a six foot four person. Wow. Which there's never been an astronaut that tall in the program. Because they're all kind of, they they're have all, to be that certain. Well, and yeah, so. So the whole concept of designing these spacesuits, there's actually colleges to educate for this now. Or they've broadened those programs. Yes. So we're broadening the program to make the, the um, and as space is becoming commercial now. Sure. So it's no longer just the domain of NASA. Uh-huh. Um, there, we need to be more inclusive with, uh, you know, depending on who's going to be going to space, if they're a space tourist, mm -hmm. um, we just need to cover more of That's a range of sizes of people. So, uh, and your name is on this suit, which your name has never been on a suit. Is that, right. we'll hear of your name now so more. So you will hear of our name because NASA is changing the way that they procure things now. Um, in uh, the, up until now, um, we were a contractor of NASA. We've been for more than 50 years now for making spacesuits, but NASA didn't want any of their contractors to have their own branding, their own company branding on the suits. So the suits- It was all NASA. It was all NASA. Yeah. Um, whereas they're going to a different procurement model, um, which will be more cost efficient, effective for us as taxpayers, mm -hmm. um, where they're allowing the companies who make the various components put their own branding on. That's so great. we'll be able to put our own branding on, so you can see ILC. And then you'll have NASA as well. And we'll have NASA on this. If it's sold to, to um, the European Space Agency, it may have ESA on it. And, and you do spacesuits for everyone in the world except... Except the Russians and the Chinese. Because? Because spacesuits, believe it or not, fall under ITAR restrictions. So they're sort of in the same category as weapons. Yes. As bombs and fighter jets and things like that. So we're restricted to what you can do. As to who we can sell them to. Dan, thank you so much for being here. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. I've always been fascinated by space and just all of it, watching the outfits and everything. I always wondered so much about where they're made and what they're made out of. And oh, that was just amazing. Envision is a company that is contracted to sew military garments. At least 25% of their workforce is either blind or sight impaired. Join us as we travel to their workplace to get a behind the scenes look at how they have learned to sew next time on Fit to Stitch.
Fit to Stitch is made possible by Kai Scissors. Benno's Buttons. OC Sewing, Orange County. Vogue Fabrics. Pendleton. Imitation of Life. And clutch nails. To order a four DVD set of Fit to Stitch Series 10, please visit our website at fittostitch.com.